This video was brought to you by the TLDR store. You can support Scottish independence with our Scotland pin, or unity with our United Kingdom set. And you can get 10% off either by using the code at the end of the video. The store is linked below. Scottish independence is always a major talking point with those excited for a potential exit, while others decry it as an inevitable disaster. So in this video, we're going to examine three major arguments in favour of Scottish independence and see if they really stack up. This obviously isn't a comprehensive list of arguments, but we'll be picking the most significant ones in our eyes. Then, in a future video, we'll be taking the opposite side and look at reasons to stay. So be sure to ring the bell icon to be notified when that video is released. Anyway, we thought that we should do this video now because recently there's been reports that the SNP have nearly agreed a pro-independence pact with the Scottish Green Party, which will give them an outright majority in the Scottish Parliament. So the SNP could be increasing their power, and their manifesto says that they plan on introducing an independence referendum bill in Parliament by the end of this sitting. So we're sort of making this video in anticipation of that. Anyway, the three arguments we're going to focus on here are 1. UK politics is becoming too focused on England. 2. More devolution isn't going to happen. And 3. The how bad can it be argument. So let's start with the first one. The UK's England centricity. More and more, the various nations of the UK have developed their own political climates. Scotland, for instance, is dominated by the SNP. In the 2019 general election, the SNP won 48 out of the 59 available seats, with a 45% plurality of the vote. And they've been doing it for a while. Since 2015, they've always held well over 35 seats, so significantly over half the available seats. By contrast, Wales is reliably Labour, and Labour have held a majority of Welsh Westminster seats since, well, forever. And despite a downturn under Corbyn, Labour had their best performance ever in the Welsh Assembly elections this year, winning nearly 40% of the vote. Northern Ireland has its own political climate for obvious reasons, and England has become more and more conservative. The problem is that in UK general elections, England has 533 seats up for grabs. The Conservatives have won a plurality of seats in England in every election since Tony Blair in 2005, and even when they lost to Blair in 2005, they still won a plurality of English votes. Obviously, because England has by far the most seats, essentially whoever wins in England wins the general election and gets to govern the rest of the UK. Of course, this makes sense insofar as the majority of the UK lives in England, but you can see how this might be politically frustrating from a Scottish perspective. It doesn't matter if you, or even the whole of Scotland votes for the SNP, or whoever else, because all that really matters is England. On to the second argument. Devolution isn't an option. A potential solution to the UK's England centricity would be more devolution, and this is exactly what happened in 1997. However, unionists today are less keen on devolution, because they think it actually encourages anti-union independence movements. Boris Johnson, for example, reportedly called Scottish devolution a disaster for precisely this reason back in November of last year. The long and short of it is that most unionists today think that the SNP were helped by devolution, rather than devolution squashing the independence movement. And, well, they're probably right. Every time that Westminster has devolved powers to Scotland, whether it be in 1997 when the Scottish Assembly was first formed, or the Scotland Act in 2016 which gave Scotland more tax-varying powers, support for Scottish independence has continued to tick up. And this means that today, unionists are unlikely to devolve power any further, in the fear that it will only encourage independent sentiment. And we saw this in the aftermath of Brexit. Pre-Brexit, agriculture, fisheries, food standards and environmental policies were all decided by the EU. After Brexit, however, these powers were going to default to the devolved governments. Hypothetically, this would have meant Scotland having different food standards to England, which would have been a logistical nightmare. 
So on October 17th, Westminster, Holyrood, the Synod and Stormont all agreed to develop common frameworks, which must be mutually agreed by the four governments, essentially fostering cooperation between the four. In the end, however, the UK decided just to take back all of the powers for themselves, with the Internal Markets Act passed in December 2020 without asking permission from any of the devolved governments. This was a violation of the Sewell Convention, which states that Westminster shouldn't legislate on devolved matters without the consent of the devolved governments. And this was only the second recent violation, after the UK government agreed the Brexit withdrawal agreement, which all the devolved assemblies were against. The point is that today's unionists don't like devolution, hence their willingness to violate the Sewell Convention, and are unlikely to allow any further devolution. If anything, they're apparently more likely than ever to take back the devolved powers, which means that the UK's politics isn't likely to get less Westminster or England focused anytime soon. And if devolution isn't an option, then, well, your only real choice is independence. So the third argument is the how bad can it be argument. Unionists often claim that independence would be a complete disaster. What currency would Scotland use? How would it afford its current standard of public services, given that it currently runs at a fiscal deficit? What would happen to the England-Scotland border if Scotland joined the EU? What would Scotland do in the event of an invasion, say by the Norwegians, given that they don't have an army? And could the UK block their accession into NATO? But really, how bad could it be plausibly? We've had a lot of political doomsayers recently. Trump's election was supposed to mean nuclear war with North Korea or Iran. Brexit was supposed to mean an immediate recession, endemic food shortages and massive queues at Dover. We're not saying that Brexit or Trump was smooth sailing, but they weren't as bad as they could have been. And the same thing might be true for Scottish independence. Sure, it won't be smooth sailing, but Scotland could get through it. And then, well, they could be an impressive country in their own right. Again, we should stress that we're not saying we buy this argument. It's just an argument that nationalists often make that we thought was worth including. Anyway, once Scotland is through the rough, it definitely has some things going for it. Scotland is uniquely well prepared for climate change, with phenomenal renewable energy capacity thanks to large amounts of wind and hydropower potential. In 2020, Scotland produced 31.8 terawatt hours of renewable energy, mostly coming from wind, with 60.3% being onshore and 10.7% offshore. And for context, that's enough to power every Scottish household for nearly three and a half years, and that capacity is expected to increase by 120% over the next few years. Essentially, Scotland already produces more renewable energy than it needs, and this gives them more power than just the electrical kind, with them selling excess electricity to the rest of the UK, to a tune of £760 million a year already. Scotland is also very well educated. In fact, some 45% of Scots have a university education, making Scotland the most educated country in Europe. The point is that while there'll be some stuff to sort out, how bad could it really be? And once Scotland gets through the worst of it, it arguably has the fundamentals of being a successful country in its own right. Anyway, those are the arguments, and I want to know what you think. Do you buy these arguments? And which ones in favour would you add to the list? Comment below your thoughts, as well as letting us know the arguments against Scottish independence that we should include in our counter-argument video. One last thing, as I mentioned at the start, we've just expanded our pin badge collection to include Wales and Northern Ireland, alongside a bunch of others, which means that you can now get a complete United Kingdom set. Or, if it's more your vibe, then you could pick up Scotland on its own, or maybe pair it with the EU, or whatever you like. Get 10% off all of the pins and everything else in our store by using code SCOTINDY. Thanks for your support. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified when we release new videos, like the one against Scottish independence that we've mentioned. Also, a special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible, and if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that is in the description.